Untold Stories is in support of the Palmer Museum. You did know we have a museum. <laughs> if you didn't, it's right across the street from the library in the visitor center. And its mission statement is to share stories and foster community. And since our stories are the real history of a community, I would say the Palmer Museum is doing just a fine job. <clears throat> now, events like the untold story don't happen on their own. There's a great deal of backstory built behind it. So I would be remiss if I did not, how's this mic, good? I would be remiss if it, I did not recognize the interim director, longtime educator, and Palmeranian, Pat Chesbro. <laughs> Betty Pierce of Hair, uh, Be Bella Hair Design. <laughs> Betty and Pat came up with this idea of untold stories, I think during a haircut. <laughs> but they have since kept these tales weaving now for six seasons. And a delicious thank you to Vagabond Blues for delicious soups and rolls. And not least, Radio Free Palmer, which is live streaming as we speak. And tonight, for a special treat, they are video live streaming as well. So after tonight, you can go home, log in to RadioFreePalmer.org, and choose on this episode and watch me over and over again. <laughs> How cool is that? You know, every winter I tell my husband, I just don't know how many more winters I have left in me. And every winter I seem to have just one more. Kind of like, you know, that which doesn't kill us makes us stronger. And tonight's theme, surviving. And if you are sitting here at the end of January in a winter where the new normal is there is no normal, I bet you all can relate to surviving. <laughs> Robertson Davies, and frankly, to be honest, I don't know who that is, but he said, every man who is attacked Every man is wise when attacked by a mad dog. Few are wise when pursued by a mad woman. But only the wisest survive when attacked by a mad notion. And what could be madder than bow hunting at 15 degrees below zero with the skimpiest sleeping bag you own? Don Burbrick is living proof of that with his story, To Build a Fire. Don? Thank you. Well, my story begins by renting the Bald Lake Public Use Cabin near Willow. It's in the Nancy Lake Recreation Area. And I, I, my plan was to use the Nancy Lake, or the, the Bald Lake Cabin as a base for my winter archery moose hunt. Now, I'd rented this cabin before. My brother Tony, his wife Julie, and I had, had uh, rented it the, the season before for the same thing, for a, for a winter bow hunt. And uh, this cabin is a typical public use cabin, 16 feet by 24 feet. Um, that's 384 square feet. Okay, so uh, it's got your basic plywood floor, your um, basic plywood bunk beds, plywood kitchen cabinet, and plywood shelving. It also comes with a really nice wood stove. And uh, these wood stoves are capable of heating a 4,000 square foot home <laughs> with uh, all the windows open. So, you know, a lot of us like to take a sauna. Uh, sleeping all night in a sauna, not so much. Uh, and, and I had the top bunk, so it's perfect. Well, I get to the Nancy Lake area and I was uh, thinking this was, was really a good idea now to, to rent this cabin because um, 15 below is not what you want to spend the night in a in a two-man uh, you know pup tent. Uh, you're you're talking about putting your 
clothes on inside your sleeping bag while you're laying down and, and your boots are frozen chunks of leather. So the cabin was a great idea. I get there, it's cold, but fortunately the, the folks before me followed the rules of the, of the you know, cabin use and they had a nice stack of firewood there waiting for me. Unfortunately, it was covered in a thin layer of ice. Uh, fortunately, there was a, a stack of newspapers, old newspapers and old magazines. So I thought, I'm all right, I'm going to be able to get through this okay. So I start out, I wad up a huge pile of newspaper and I put it in the wood box, the fire box, and I put the smallest of the logs in there and I light it off. It was warm for about one minute. <laughs> so that's ah, all right, I'll, I, I'll get this. Another big pile of, uh, of firewood, or big pile of newspapers and those same logs and light it off and nothing. Now you're, you're figuring this out, I, I'm a really bad fire builder. Yeah, so my wife, she's a great fire builder. Uh, she wasn't there. All right, so I decide um, I'm gonna get out my favorite hunting knife. I'm gonna use a, a log for a hammer and I'm gonna split this firewood up. So I, I start to pound my knife through this log and, and it's uh, about halfway through and it's not going through any further. And it's, I'm thinking, how am I gonna skin a moose? I can't even get it out of the log. It was like the, like the sword in the stone. It was the knife in the log. So I, uh, I, decide, I, put it, I put what I did get in there, and I, and I uh, put more newspaper in and started it, you know, lit the fire. Yeah, you guessed it, nothing. So I'm like, forget this. I'm just going to put all my hunting clothes on, except for my boots. I'm going to crawl into my sleeping bag and see if I can get at least a couple hours sleep. Ten minutes later... I'm shivering on that bunk like I didn't have a sleeping bag. And you don't need a good sleeping bag when you have a warm cabin, right? Yeah, no problem. So um, I decide I'm just going to get back up, and I'm going to spend the night throwing one wad of newspaper in that <laughs> stove, one after another, and it was all night long, except for the few articles I read in Good Housekeeping. <laughs> Next morning, I get up. I'm exhausted. And I head back to my truck because I have a chainsaw stashed there. Now, I know what you're thinking. If you had a chainsaw stashed in your truck, why didn't you go back there last night and, you know, eliminate all this misery? Well, if all outdoor enthusiasts were smart, we wouldn't have these survival stories. <laughs> I'm doing my part to keep this genre alive. All right, so I, uh, I get the chainsaw. I get back to the cabin, I cut the first dead spruce tree down that I see, I cut it up, I drag it into the cabin, and I build a roaring fire, a blazing fire. Felt like that, um, that story, cremation of Sam McGee. I was the guy in the boiler, I felt warm and I felt wonderful. Well, this would be a good place to end this story. The, the, smart, the smart outdoor enthusiast would pack it up and go home. But you get to hear what I did. So I'm all, I'm all warmed up now. I thought, well, I better do what I came for. I, I'm going to go do some hunting. So I pull on my warmest, thickest wool hunting pants. I put on my big, thick, over, over probably, I didn't need that, but a super thick uh, hunting coat. Put on my Sorrel boots, and I, I grabbed my trusty longbow named Yellow Jacket <laughs> and my quiver full of arrows, and I headed out across the lake. I got across the lake, okay, and... And I, I headed through the deeper snow up into the woods. And somewhere in the woods, I, I don't remember exactly where, but I came across this really odd site. It was a perfectly flat meadow. And I, I thought, well, what could have caused this? Maybe it was part of an old homestead. I, I, in the journal in the cabin, I'd read a story about Whiskey Jack. He was apparently a, a homesteader that showed up un, unannounced with his shotgun at the cabin. And I thought, well, maybe this was his old homestead. I discovered his old homestead. He... he obviously spent a lot of time getting this field perfectly smooth and level. And in the movies right now, you'd hear a crack, but I fell right through that beaver pond. <laughs> now, as luck would have it, and I don't know how it happened, but I ended up with my longbow under my armpits, and I'm suspended there. It kept me from going all the way under. And, uh, I discovered a funny thing right there. It's kind of a phenomenon. You don't hear a lot about this. You don't read about this in, in studies or anything like that. But if, if you combine uh, fear and panic and ice water, you can speak in foreign languages. <laughs> Mine sounds something like this. 
Now you could probably translate that all by yourself. Um, so I, uh, I finally get my wits about me and I, I crawl, kind of porpoise kick and, and kick out of the, the water and I work my way over to the shore and I get up and I'm thinking, yeah, I, I could be in trouble here. I, I need to get myself back to the cabin as fast as I can. So I, I, it was kind of a slow, slushy jog, you can picture that. And, uh, and I, I was making pretty good time. I, I came around a corner, I could see the cabin, still smoke billowing up out of the chimney. And I thought, I'm going to make it. So I'm going to be all right. And, and I did okay until that last 100 feet. And uh, by then I was kind of freezing up, doing a nice uh, imitation of the Tin Man and the Wizard of Oz. The last three steps up to the, uh, to the cabin gave me the most trouble. I kind of had to do a, a hop. There was this hopping action that worked for me pretty good. And, and uh, got in the cabin. It's warm. Stripped off those wet clothes. I sat on the bunk in my underwear waiting for them to dry. And uh, as soon as I could get my stuff packed up and get my clothes back on, I headed to the truck. I got out there as fast as I could. And I never went back. <laughs> Thank you very much. You know, the great thing about stories is that you can connect to them. And Don, I can't build fires either. And so I remember one time I was trying to build a fire in my house, like a fireplace. And it wouldn't go, it wouldn't go, it wouldn't go. And I go, wait, what if I use some gas? <laughs> yeah, that happened. <laughs> Speaking of survival of the fittest, Charles Darwin said that a man can live about 40 days without food, about three days without water, <clears throat> about eight minutes without air, but he said a man cannot survive a moment without hope. Linda Lozanoff, with her story, Whatever It Takes, knows all about this. When everything is going right, until everything goes wrong. Linda? Does this work? Okay. Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis was once asked in an interview what was her greatest accomplishment, and she said merely that she survived. So I think back of many times that I survived, and the story I share with you tonight is a survival story of epic Alaskan kind. So flash back to 1991, 27 years ago. My really good friend Marty and I thought, we've got a great idea. We're going to go spend our spring break up on the mountain house on the Ruth Glacier. So to set the scene, the mountain house is 40 minutes by air from Talkeetna. It sets out on a nunatak, a rock and ice outcropping um, in the Ruth um, Amphitheater, Ruth Gorge. Surrounding it is Mount Burrill, Mount Dickey, the Moose's Tooth, not named after the pizza restaurant, pizza restaurant named after it. 10 miles away, Denali. So our expedition consisted of Dennis, one very serious English teacher, take note, Emily, one unemployed adventurer, a dog musher, and two stunningly beautiful special ed teachers with a lot of energy and really organized. So Marty and I had spent about a week and a half, two weeks, preparing elaborate dinners, cooking them, freezing them. No mountain house food for this crew. That was in the survival food if we need it. We ground mounds of coffee. We bought the best cheese and salami. You get the picture. We were going to eat well. Most importantly, we had beverages. We had cases of Rainier and Miller beer. Rhonda, no, no, no brewery, no craft beer yet. That, that hadn't happened. We had bottles of Jägermeister, bottles of Yukon Jack for our six days on the mountain. So tensions rose high, though, before we even left. Because Jeff, who arrived the day before we left on the, on the trip to the mountain house, had just come back from the smushing trip from Connect to Nome. And when sur surveying our supplies, he said, why so much? And I thought, you Eagle Scout, you know the motto, be prepared. This is not like great artwork where less is more. We're going up to the mountain house for six days and more is best. 
So with that, we depart on Saturday. We arrive and we, or we fly through beautiful bluebird skies, arrive to mounds of fresh powdery snow. There had been a, a storm the week before, and we were so excited to be there to ski, eat, drink, and be merry, which is exactly what we did. We met our neighbors, two uh, climbers from Japan, and a group of three from Colorado. Well, on the third day after a splendid day of skiing, we were in the mountain house having dinner, and suddenly it shifted to the left, and it shifted to the right, and it shook like what felt like forever, just like the other night. So we ran outside, and cascading from these peaks is just avalanche after avalanche after avalanche. And the snow is cascading down and rising, and we're thinking, hey, we're safe. We're at 5,800 feet, and the snow is falling beneath us. Everything's good. But that should have been an omen for things yet to come. So two more days of eat, drink, and be married, keeping warm. Oh, I forgot to say, we had a lot of firewood, and we could make a fire. Uh, and some previous uh, visitors to the mountain house had left some really eclectic reading material. They left a book called The Fart Book. We already use that to uh, start a fire. Um, anyway, so now it's Friday. We're staying in the mountain house. It's really tight quarters for four people. And um, we're, about, we're about ready to leave. So we pack up our things on Friday night as best we can um, in, in anticipation of an airplane the next morning. Well, Saturday morning we wake up and we're socked in. And it's snowing. And it's snowing. It's okay though, because we're going skiing. We had Sunday still to get picked up. Well, Sunday we wake up, same thing, dumping snow, socked in, no airplane today. Three of the four of us had to be back at work on Monday, but yeah, we really weren't too worried about that. So on Sunday we skied and helped dig out our neighbors around their tent and uh, the door around the mountain house. So now we had to think seriously, well, we ate all our elaborate dinners. We're now having to ration the extra food and wood that we had brought, that the women had brought. We still have plenty of liquor. So, <laughs> truly, we did. <laughs> um, so on Monday, we're skiing, and my friend Marty's in front of me, and she makes a beautiful telemark turn, and suddenly she falls, and she yells, Hey, Lou! I think I broke my damn leg. She called me Lou, and that's what I go by today. And I skied down to her, and I thought, there's no way. That was the most beautiful, gentle fall. And I got to her, and I said, Marty, come on, get up. What's up? She said, no, I think I broke my damn leg. So Dennis and Jeff ski over, and we're like, hey, we got to get her back up to the mountain house, which is several hundred feet above us in this deep, heavy snow. I went up, got a sled. We, I came back down, we put her in the sled, we drug her up to the mountain house, got her in, took off her boot, and sure enough, her leg was swollen, and it was broken. So what we did is we had all those cases of Rainier and Miller. We used the cardboard to splint her leg, along with some of the extra kindling. And the one thing that Jeff did contribute to this trip was a very complete medical kit which, um, from the smushing trip, which had Percocet in it, which back 27 years ago really came in handy. Well, now we knew we were in serious trouble. We've got someone with a broken leg. We're running out of food. We're all getting really pissed off at each other by this time because it's really tight quarters. So I made a prediction. I said, all right, you guys, when all this liquor is gone, we're getting off this mountain. Drink up, which we did. So the next day was Wednesday. And we decided, you know, if a plane's going to come, we need a runway. We don't have a runway anymore. So seven of the nine of us went out, went down to where the runway should have been, had our skis on, and proceeded to make a runway 500 feet long, 100 feet wide. And we stomped to the left. We stomped to the right all day long. We took our mountaineering wands with um, fluorescent flagging lined them along the runway so that hopefully when the pilot came, he would be able to see where the runway was and said, okay, hopefully tomorrow. Well, tomorrow was Thursday. Tomorrow was Thursday, and we woke up, and there was a big, beautiful blue sucker hole. <laughs> we thought a plane's coming today. So shortly after that, we heard the hum of a plane coming. We were all pr already pretty much packed in anticipation of going. And so I could see the plane coming. I skied down to the runway. Uh, Jay Hudson of Hudson Air got out of his plane and said, do you need food? And I was like, no, we're good with food, but we have someone with a broken leg. He said, send her down with someone to go with her to Talkeetna. Two other people in the 185. Another 185 is coming. And then I thought, you know, there's nine of us. 
and I am going on that second plane. I'm not getting left behind to be the single person who might get sucked in. By 7 p.m. that night, we're all in Talkeetna. We're all safe. I call my principal, and I say, hey, we're off the mountain. And he said, you know, tomorrow's an in-service day. You will be there, won't you? And I thought, yeah, yeah, right. Well, from this experience and many other survival stories throughout my life, I, I call back on that one because we were able to survive the harshness of Alaska and the environment, the tensions and emotions with being with a, in a group um, under such dire um, experiences. And then I th put this out to all of you. Adventurers, if you go out into the Alaska wilderness for an adventure, make sure you are prepared because your adventure just might turn into a survival story. Thank you. So from the sounds of it, you guys have been in Talkeetna once? <laughs> Maybe in the snow once? A plane? You know, stories connect us. But surviving isn't about standing up. Surviving's about falling down and not staying down. Herman Hess said once, some of us think that holding on makes us strong, but sometimes it's in the letting go. Here's Alice Coolhane with meeting Pete and ditching Paul. And then like that, that's how we do this. Hold on a second, come on up here. Yeah. This is this is Pete Praetorius, and my story is about how we how we met. Okay. <laughs> It was July 5th, 1986, back in the days of uh, wagon trains. And I had just, um, I was finishing up a long distance bike trip. I'd bicycled from Fairbanks down to Portland, Oregon, and had then flown back up to Anchorage. It was on my way back to, to Fairbanks. And I decided to stop in Denali Park because they had a, a free campground there to spend the night. And so I get there and I pitch my tent, I throw in my sleep bag because I'm really good at this, I've done a lot of bike touring, and I crawl into my tent after eating four peanut butter sandwiches because I've bicycled 120 miles that day. So I'm in my tent and all of a sudden I hear this voice go, hey, that's Alice's tent, she's a poet. I'm like, what the heck, I just want to go to sleep. And I open up the tent, the tent fly, and there's these two guys kind of squatting down looking at me. One is, one is kind of disheveled, and the other one looks a little bit like John Den with his big smile and got a lot of teeth. And I'm thinking, <laughs> who's this guy? The guy that introduced me, he was Paul. I'd met him the previous summer when I was in, um, when I was in Denali. And, and so I, I listened and I hear that, that Pete is from, from California and he's driven his international scout pickup um, up to Denali and I think, oh, oh, big deal. Okay, good night, guys. And I send them on the way. And then the next morning I, I get up, I go and get a shower and I go over to the communal picnic table and there's Pete and there's, and there's Paul. And, and we start to talk, and we talk mainly about the day's itinerary, and I'm going to be uh, heading into Wonder Lake and then bicycling, bicycling back. Pete's going on a trip, Paul's going on a trip. So we do our trips, and I come back out of Wonder Lake. I'm, I'm pretty hungry uh, at the end of the second night, and Pete and Paul are at the picnic table. And Pete's made a big dinner, and it's really nice, and I get to eat the dinner, and Paul gets to eat the dinner. And I'm thinking, this guy might have a, a few good points about him, even though I'm not looking for anybody. And so I decide to stick around next couple days. Pete and I do some fun things. We climb Mount Healy. We go can collecting around the campground so that we can, we can buy a six-pack of beer. That was a whole lot of fun. Right. And then also he gets along with people. That's another point in his favor. I, I mean, I kind of like this guy. And so then... The next morning, he invites me on a date to Carlos Creek to the music festival. Oh, boy. I'm thinking, this is, I don't know. Oh, it's okay, because Paul's coming with us. going to ride shotgun in the back of the car. So we go. We head off to, um, 
to Carlos Creek, and everything is fine. I'm with Pete. I'm with Paul. We're going through the, the parking lot, and all of a sudden, I see my truck. I'm thinking, oh, shit, my truck is here. The story is, is that I had lent my truck to Jeff in May. Jeff had the previous summer helped me out when I was down in the Kenai working in the cannery, and he'd shown up. He was from Colorado. He showed up back up at my place in May, and just to get him out and get him going when I was on my way on my bike trip, I lent him my truck. I did not want to see him right at that point in time. <laughs> so we got this truck here. No nukes. It's good nukes on the back. It's kind of, kind of pukish colored. And so Paul says, Paul says, it's a Toyota. And Pete says, what year is it? I'm like, oh boy, oblivious guys. They follow me like little ducks into the campground and there's Jeff, who has borrowed my truck, sitting under the, under the tree. And he's, he's stoned. You gotta know Jeff is slightly autistic and slightly schizophrenic. And so, so we're standing around. Jeff pulls out a joint, hands it to Pete. <laughs> Comic relief, I planned this. And then he hands it, hands it to Paul, does not, not imbibe because Paul has worked in a bestos mine in Louisiana, doesn't have very good lungs. And they pass it to me. And then I realize what I'm dealing with here. I'm dealing with one, a former boyfriend who's self medicating. Number two, um, a happy stoner. Um, number three, again, a guy who worked in the, the, the mines in Louisiana, and me. And this does not feel good to me. So what I do is I, I take charge of the situation. I tell. Uh, Pete and Paul, go play hacky sack. Go drink the beers. I gotta have a talk with Jeff. And Jeff is not 100% coherent. But what I tell Jeff is, yeah, I need to get you back to Colorado. I understand that your dog Homer is in Colorado that you got the previous summer, and that your parents want to have him put in an animal shelter, and you just need to get home. We're packing it up. We're heading home. So I pack up my stuff, he packs up his stuff, and I take him back to Fairbanks. I had told Pete and Paul, I said, see you later. I didn't give him much of an explanation about this. So, so then I take back Jeff back to Fairbanks, I put him on the, the plane, phew, I think, okay? Well, I live in an off-the-grid place, I don't have any running water, so I take my bicycle and I take my laundry up to, up to UAF, and I walk into the laundromat, and there's Paul. <laughs> And Paul, Paul, Paul says, hi, Alice, how you doing? I says, I'm doing good. And he says, well, me and Pete, we're staying over in the campground over there, UAF. I says, without thinking, well, you know, come by sometime. That'd be really nice. Two hours later, I get home. Three hours later, there's a knock on my door. It's Pete and it's Paul. And Pete and Paul come into the house and, you know, we have a couple beers. And then Pete and Paul uh, roll the sleeping bags and they stay on the, on the floor. So I still have Pete and Paul there to deal with. And it gets to be just like Denali. Pete makes the meals, he fixes the bicycles, he does all this good stuff, and Paul, he just kind of hangs out. And things are starting to get a little hot with me and Pete, but we have Paul to deal with. So <laughs> what am I going to do? Yeah. And, and Pete's getting a little annoyed, because he's got this little edge about him that nobody knows about except me. And so I decide. Well, we're gonna do something about this. And I says to Pete, I think it's time. And he says, yes, it's time. So what we did was, we made some peanut butter sandwiches for Paul. We put him back in the back of the pickup. We drove the North Pole, and we put him out in the rain to hitchhike home. <laughs> and Pete then came back with me to my place, and he stays, and I've never been able to get rid of him. <laughs> Thank you. You know, Alice, I wish I'd known that peanut butter jelly sandwich trick. It could have saved me so much trouble. <laughs> um, Mary Trinsky, Troshinsky couldn't make it from Fairbanks tonight, so our break is going to come a little early. And before we stretch for a short break, I'd like to give special 
recognition tonight for the guitarist who is providing music for us, Russ Dunlap. All of these beautiful quilts of incredible craftsmanship are from the collection of Patty Dubler. So, Pat O'Connor, got it right, good. Pat O'Connor got a package of postcards that the of old pictures of the Matanuska Valley that the Palmer Museum sells. Well, on it, he finds his wife. <laughs> and this is Arlita, when she was Arlita Goodrich, and her buddy Davy, Davy Harrison, and they're eating a little ice cream cone. Her mom worked in the bottom of the laundromat, and every day they got a dime. They could go across to Matt Maid, where is now Palmer Ale House, and buy an ice cream. Because you sure wouldn't save that. <laughs> and so here they are, eating an ice cream cone. And the story goes on that the picture was actually taken by a serviceman. He thought he they were cute, and they took a picture. he took a picture of them. Now we'd like... Go, go like get really worried about that but he left and a couple weeks later or several time passed and an envelope appeared with this picture taped on the front of it addressed to Matanuska Valley <laughs> and uh, there you go how cool is that And that's the cool things about stories. You never know when they're going to pop up, and there's a connection here, and there's a connection here. Now, I'm not a grandmother, and to be honest with you, it doesn't look like I'm going to be one real soon. So I don't know anything about being a grandmother. But I hear it's very nice. I hear it's the next best thing to slice bread. And how does it go? Grandmothers are like moms only with lots and lots of frosting. <laughs> Marilyn Bennett can relate to this in her story, The Tooth Fairy. Marilyn? How many of you believe in the Tooth Fairy? <laughs> A lot. I was not a believer until one cold day in January. It was January 23rd. I was getting on a plane in Minneapolis to come to Valdez, Alaska for the birth of my first grandchild on January 25th. This is exciting. Of course, when I arrived in Anchorage, I still had to get on that little plane. And I had two giant suitcases back before you had to pay extra. You know. One of them was full of diapers because they apparently didn't have those particular diapers in Alaska. You know. <laughs> and then I had my carry-on, and then I had a big purse, and then of course I had my big computer. So there I am going down the tunnel to the Valdez airport looking like some kind of bag lady, you know. But got on the plane, and it was snowing out, and it was so beautiful, and it was kind of windy, but mm, no, it wasn't that bad. I mean, I am from Minnesota, you know. So the plane was bouncing around, but I had been on little planes before, and it didn't seem like it was really a big deal. About a half an hour into the trip, the pilot said, the winds have gotten up to 40 miles an hour in the Thompson Pass, and there's a blizzard coming, and so it's going to be too dangerous to go into Valdez. We're turning around. We're going back to Anchorage. What? You can't go back to Anchorage. I'm about to be a grandmother. In two days, I have to be there. This can't be. And besides that, if you've ever been on a little tiny plane, 
up in the mountains and it's making a U-turn. This is scary business. I didn't like that at all. We landed safely back in Anchorage. And then I went up to see about getting a ticket for the next day and found out they were all sold out. And the soonest I could get there would be to get a ticket on 5 o'clock on the 25th, which is when the baby was due. It's like, oh, that's not going to work. But what can you do? I called up my daughter and told her. My son-in-law said, well, go and see if you can get on standby the next morning. And if you can't, if you can, then I'll come over in the mountains and get you. Thought, oh great, then my daughter will be there with nobody there if we get stuck. <laughs> so I called and I got a motel room, went and gathered up my two suitcases, my carry-on, my big purse, and my computer, and I went down to wait for the cab to go to the motel. As I was standing there, there was these people there. There was a fellow and three young ladies. And they said, you were on the plane with us in Valdez, weren't you? And I said, yes, I was. <laughs> said, I was trying to get to Valdez because my daughter's having her first baby in two days. And now I can't get there. <laughs> and he said, well, I'm an orthodontist. And we have to be in Valdez tomorrow morning because we have to tighten braces. <laughs> and I rented a van. Would you like to come along? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> so, of course, they had planned to eat in Valdez, so now we had to go out to eat first. So we all went out to eat. I called up my daughter and said, no problem, I have a ride. <laughs> so by the time we finished eating and everything, it was around 8 o'clock, and we started off over the mountains. By this time, it was snowing a little more, <laughs> maybe a lot more. <laughs> and I found out that the doctor was from Alabama. <laughs> He just moved here. <laughs> he started up a place in Fairbanks, and this is his first time driving in the snow <laughs> over a mountain. Well, <laughs> we were alone on the road. <laughs> Didn't make me feel good. And then his assistant decided to tell us about what is, how it is like driving out here because she grew up near the Matanuska Glacier. So therefore, she had lots of stories. <laughs> oh, she told us about how cars would just go right off <laughs> over in the cliff. No one wouldn't even find the car until spring. <laughs> We're sliding along and the road's kind of disappearing. And then to make us feel really like there was no hope, she assured us that our cell phones would not work. <laughs> she kept this up all night. <laughs> kept us all awake. <laughs> We slowed down to about 25, 35 miles an hour. Nobody passed us. That's what was really scary. <laughs> but we did make it to Valdez. Ah, 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> and the next, that was the 24th. And on the 25th, my granddaughter Hannah was born. <laughs> and you know, I've never had warm feelings about orthodontists. <laughs> but this 
doctor from Alabama was so focused on teeth in Valdez <laughs> that he got us there on time for her birth. I'm now a believer in the tooth fairy. Ken Kesey said once, now he wasn't referring to your news feed, but he said, oh, to hell with facts. Tell more stories. <laughs> and we have two more for you tonight. Surviving is perhaps not so much about living as it is about the lessons learned. And I've learned a lot along the way, most of which I was supposed to learn in kindergarten. <laughs> but I'm a slow processor. Things like share. Pick up your toys, look both ways, hold hands. My personal favorite, stop <laughs> and think. <laughs> Deborah Moore has survived with lessons learned from her horse. In this story, lessons from Rico. There. Do you want this like this? Or? Hi. So I've always believed that horses were great teachers. And over the past 50 years or so, I've had some wonderful teachers for horses, or horses have been some wonderful teachers. But one horse has stood out for a long time in my, my training. The horse's name was Rico. Now, Rico started training me the very first day that I went out to look at him. I'd come up here with the military. I was only supposed to be up here two years. So I'm like, I'm not going to drag my horse to Alaska. I'll just get one up here that needs some training, and then rehome me when I get sent somewhere else. So that was my plan. Little did I know, I was going to be the one getting the training. So I went out to look at Rico, and he wouldn't let us catch him. He would have nothing to do with us. He kept running away from us, but he was watching us the whole time. And I was watching him. Ooh, I like this horse. He is really a nice mover and everything. So I'm like, his owners finally get there, and we get him caught, and, you know, I decide that, yes, I want this horse. And that's my first lesson in survival is the fact that um, if you really want something, you have to work for it a little bit because then it makes you appreciate it. So Rico taught me to appreciate him that very first day when I couldn't catch him. <laughs> But the funny thing is, is that within a week, he was following me around like a little puppy dog because he wasn't a hard-to-catch horse. He had just learned not to really trust people too much, and I was just another person until he got to know me. So that was his first lesson. Then a little later on, he taught me another lesson, and this lesson was about being fair. So Rico, he wasn't always the perfect horse. Sometimes when I went to tr trim his back feet, he would try to kick at me. And over the 20 years, I think he caught me once or twice. But I could yell at him. I could slap him on the butt, tell him to behave himself, and he did. He was fine. He's like, okay, I shouldn't have done that. But one day, I was getting done with the ride, and I was leading him up to the tack room. And as I reached up to open the door, he bumped my hand. He bumped it pretty hard, so I thumped him. Well, I untacked him and turning loose. Unbeknown to me, I'd hurt his feelings. He wouldn't let me catch him for three days. <laughs> I finally had to get some friends over to help trap this horse so that I could apologize to him. <laughs> and he taught me that watch your punishment. Don't make it worse than the crime because he didn't think he'd done anything wrong. And then if you have to apologize, apologize from your heart. Because believe it or not, after I apologized to this horse, he turned back into the lovely puppy dog that he'd been for, you know, forever. So you really want to be careful in those things. The next lesson that he, can, he taught me was the fact that um, you're responsible for your own happiness. Okay, one day I looked out my window, and Rico's out there in the field teaching a class to the other horses. My husband actually took pictures of this. I was amazed. But he was standing on one side of a mud puddle. He had three or four horses standing on the other side of the mud puddle. 
and he was pawing, pawing at the, at the water, stirring it all up. Then he'd lay down in it and really get all wet. Then he'd run over to a sandy spot, kind of a dirty spot that he'd created, and roll in the dust. Then he ran back to the water puddle and rolled again. I thought he was my Kentucky Fried Chicken horse. Two of the horses watched and said, oh, that is great. And they proceeded to do it too, much to their owner's disgust. <laughs> and the other two horses backed away and said, oh, no, that is not for us. But Rico didn't care. He's like, it made him happy. There didn't hurt anybody else. Do it. So I'm like, you know, that's a good philosophy in life. If it makes you happy, do it, as long as you're not hurting anybody else. So then probably the greatest lesson that Rico ever taught me happened. I got orders, because I'm still in the Army Reserves, to go to Iraq. I'm like, oh, great. Not a really nice place to be in 2005. But I was taking Rico out for a ride, and we were riding about six miles over to a friend's house, and we had to go down this road, and it was asphalt, but the borough had just recently repaired it with these black strips going across the entire road. For three miles, these black strips went across the road. And I rode Rico up to the first one. He looked at it he, really carefully and then very gently stepped over it and trotted away. I go, he'll get over it, right? They, the horses do that. They get used to things and they get over it. No. For three miles, we did this and then trotted over it. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's kind of strange. Why is he doing this? And I figured out. There was a lesson to me getting ready to go to Iraq not to be complacent. And I was to always pay attention and do like a horse would, learn from a horse. So when I was in Iraq, I sometimes felt like I was twisting my ears to listen behind me. And I was watching very carefully. And it paid off. I would delay our, our trip, because I was the person in charge of these missions out into Baghdad. I would change our route just on a whim, like, eh, I don't feel like going that way today. Let's do it this way. Well, that night, I would go back into the meetings and I'd hear about another team that went out the way I decided not to go and got hit by snipers or an IED, bombs, and whatnot. And that happened 27 times. And every time I would say thank you to Rico <laughs> for that little lesson that he taught me. So, you know, Rico was an awesome horse. I got back from Iraq, the first thing I did was go out and ride my horse. Rico, of course. You know what, he lived life you know, he still tried to continue to teach me. He's been trying to teach me not to get lost on trails. It didn't work. I still get lost on trails. But if I'm on my horse, he takes me home again when he's ready. <laughs> but he lived life. You know, he did what he loved, and he loved what he did. did. And I feel that's a great experience and things that, you know, we need to do to survive this life. Thank you. I have some horse stories, <laughs> but I'm not going to tell them. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, I don't remember who said this, but I read it once. And it said they thought all stories should end with, and then they all burst into flames. <laughs> because isn't that what it is about stories? It's not like what happens, it's like what is going to happen next. Well, Jim Sykes has a story, and I'm happy to tell you he doesn't burst out into flames. <laughs> but he's got a good story with barely a moment to survive. Well, it was a gray day in October that kind of got lazy after breakfast at our log cabin, little log cabin in the northeast hills, northeast of Talkeetna. The kids after breakfast began to play. Cindy, my wife, was putting some stuff away. I tuned into the BBC on shortwave, which is the way we got it in those days, and uh, decided what I would do. and. Um, I casually mentioned to Cindy, I said, you know, maybe I'll just go to Talkeetna today and 
trying to clean up some of the loose ends for the new radio station we just got on the air. And that would mean a, about a five mile hike to the Susitna River, inflate the kayak and paddle 12 miles, and um, Cindy didn't think it was a good idea. And uh, she said, you're probably not going to get there much before dark. And uh, so she had a point. So I thought, well, uh, what could I do to go faster? I mean, I could travel light. And um, um, we rarely had any trouble on the trail. So I thought about, well, this is the time of the, the both the black bears and the brown bears are circling up before they den up in the winter. And uh, I, I'd like to take something, but I don't really want to carry the shotgun. And besides that, if I left the shotgun with her, she would have ammo. And if she needed it, I could take the bear spray. And so uh, at that moment, on the BBC, they started interviewing a guy from Fort Rich. And he was taking care of the bears in the dump. And uh, so I listened very carefully. And the reporter at the end said, look, if you had a choice, what would you choose? Would you choose the bear spray or the shotgun? And the guy says, bear spray any day. And I thought, well, that kind of applies to my, to my situation here, because I can travel faster and lighter, and Cindy can have the gun. And so with that, I, I took my uh, little daughter's tiny little nylon backpack, and I threw in the bear spray and some <laughs> water and a, and a raincoat. And, um, and it was kind of tight, but uh, <laughs> uh, Cindy said, uh, I, I still don't think this is a good idea. And I said, well, uh, yeah, I, I thought about that, and I, I think I'll be OK. So um, have a good day. And I headed down the trail like a good husband would, right? Uh, and so um, uh, the four, first four miles went very, very quickly. I was very impressed with my choice to have this light pack. And uh, it was starting to rain a little bit. And I, I, I stepped into an alder patch about a mile away from the Susitna River. And I, I, I could hear the water on the leaves. And a few steps later into the alder patch, why? Here's Mother Bear and her cub, less than 30 feet away off the trail. And I thought, oh, Bear, before I could think spray, she was charging me. And uh, I backed up against some trees, and I raised my hands to the sky, and I screamed as loud as I've ever screamed in my life. And it was loud. And she backed off a little bit to my right. And uh, we eyeballed each other for a second, and I thought, I wonder if I can get this pack off. <laughs> and she, she charged again, and I screamed, and I raised my hands, and I thought, boy, this, this can't keep going on because the cub is over there and she is over here. So I thought, well, maybe, maybe if I give her a little space, she'll take the cub off and that's what I'll do. So I ran around the trees that I was kind of backed up against and she followed me. <laughs> and she stood up on her hind legs and I could see all the gray hairs on her stomach. And she came at me growling and snapping and waving her paws and backed me up against the trees on the other side. And and uh, we are almost exactly the same height. But she was growling and snapping, very, very angry kind of mama bear. And I could smell her breath. We were nose to nose. I could see the blueberry stains on her snapping teeth. And uh, I, d I didn't have anywhere to go. And I, I looked into her eyes. And they were just like polished black marbles. And I flashed on the movie Jaws while I was there. <laughs> <coughs> And the movie said that this shark is an eating machine with expressionless black eyes. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I think we're there. And I, and I thought I was going to get it. And so she, she'd been hitting me on my shoulders and scraping me on my chest with her claws, very long, very, very big, impressive black claws. And um, she, was, she kept hitting me. And so I, she was going to hit me again on my right shoulder, and I so I reached out and I grabbed her paw and I shoved it away as, as fast as, as far away as I could. And she did this enormous neck stretcher and bit me in the hand. <clears throat> and, but it got her off balance and she was now down on all fours facing away from me. So I went the other way and went around the trees again and I kneeled down, clasped my fingers behind my neck and buried my head in the grass. And I played dead. And I could hear breathing. And it was mine. <laughs> and uh, I uh, couldn't hear anything else. I thought I would at least hear the bear move. And I thought the next thing that's probably going to happen is I'm going to get bit in the butt, because that's what was sticking up the highest. <clears throat> and then I'll feel the black claws and be mauled. But nothing, nothing happened. 
And so I, I really wanted to take a look, but I was committed to playing dead. I didn't move. It was an eternity. It was at least a minute or two. And I got up on my good hand, and I started to look around, and then I heard this enormous, loud, <laughs> So the bear was chuffing, and the good news is, is that the sound was getting softer as she took the cub over the edge of the hill. And so then I exhaled. <laughs> then I got the pack off my back, and I got the bear spray out. <laughs> and so <clears throat> the only difficulty was is that my right hand had swelled to about twice its size and was extremely painful. And I thought, well, it's not bleeding badly, but it's a puncture wound. I think I'd better rinse it out. So I got out the water, and I poured it in and squeezed the wound, which was very excruciatingly painful, <clears throat> but I got it done, and then I became cold. And I thought, this is either maybe shock or the fact I haven't been wearing my raincoat or whatever, but I put on the raincoat, I securely had the bear spray in my left hand, and I knew I had a dry clothes in a pack down by the railroad tracks at the river. And I listened with 2,000% increased sensitivity as I went down to the river, and I got to my pack and pulled it out, and I quickly realized that just moving the hand was so painful, I decided not to do it. I figured I could take, I, I could keep warm if I kept moving, but I was resigned to hiking the 12 miles down the railroad tracks, which by the way, if you've ever done it, is very unpleasant, to Talkeetna. And so I, I put the pack back away, stepped up to the railroad tracks, and I see a light coming up the tracks. And it turns out to be attached to one of those little gas maintenance cars. And I flagged it down, and I showed the guy in my hand. I says, can you take me to Talkeetna? And he said, let me check. He, cleared, he made sure the tracks were clear, got in, put it in reverse, and I got to Talkeetna in time to interrupt Dr. Jordan Greer's dinner. <laughs> and so uh, it turns out that the good news I learned is that bears rarely have rabies. So we didn't do the rabies shots, and he told me to soak it in iodine water a couple times a night. So I thought, I better, I better tell the family, because I'm obviously not going to be back home. This is 17 miles away now. So um, I got on the CB radio, which is what we did for communications in those days, and my little daughter answered. And I said, Zara, I want to tell you I love you very, very much. And she says, I love you too, Daddy. And I hear Cindy's voice in the background ask him what happened. <laughs> so... Um, I figured that she figured I'd dump the kayak in the river, but that wasn't true. But anyway, I told the story, and the next day I found a pilot who would take me up uh, to the treeless tundra above our cabin and landed in a beautiful, nice day, got out of the plane, and now I have a revolver and bear spray <laughs> because one of my Talkeetna friends says, you can't go back without this. So anyway... The plane takes off, and I suddenly feel less confident than I had b ever been, even though I'd been up there without anything, bear spray or guns, before. But I listened, again, 2,000% sensitivity all the way to the cabin. And when I climbed up the last hill to the cabin, I was really sweaty. The family was glad to see me, but I just wanted to get my sweaty clothes off. So I went into the cabin. I happened to be in front of the mirror, took off my T-shirt, and there were the marks of the bears. I had bruises on my arms and shoulders, and claw marks down my chest. And I reflected on my day <laughs> and uh, felt extremely lucky that I had um, left against the advice of my wife, encountered a mama bear just doing her job, found an after-hours rail car and a doctor. But to tell you the truth, when I was there nose to nose and hand to paw with mama bear, I really didn't know that this story would ever be told. Thank you. you know, Mr. Sykes, I've built a fire. I've had a horse. I've driven in the snow. I've been to the Ruth Glacier. But I got nothing. And that makes me happy. <laughs> Before we go to our thank yous, I want to just do some logistics. We have lots of leftover biscuits and soup. Uh, $2 for a cup with a lid for the soup. 
and six 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 biscuits for two dollars cash is preferred so thank you for coming out tonight thank you again to pat chesbro betty pierce russ dunlap the beautiful quilts and radio free palmer don't forget radiofreepalmer.org you can listen to these stories again and again and video so please, just one more round of applause. <laughs> My favorite uh, author, John Steinbeck, said that when he would try to interview people and get together and learn about him, if he just introduced himself, he, he didn't get any response. But if he started with a little story, it was just like they would all gather around and start talking and sharing things, and he learned so much. So even if you've never been charged by a bear, fallen through a frozen pond, or splintered your friend's leg with empty beer boxes, you've survived. And there's something about all of these stories that you could connect to that brought you to one of your own stories of perhaps another time and another place. Our stories remind us that at the end of winter, at the end of January, in Palmer, Alaska, in the old Palmer Depot, we have so much more in common than we do in difference. But don't forget, there's April. April for the seventh Untold Stories episode, and it's called Road Trip. Oh, yes, our love affair with our cars, cars, trucks, and motorcycles on the roads they've taken us down or up. Send your submissions to director at palmermuseum.org sometime in March, and we'll let you know who's selected, and we'll have two practices in April. So I take my leave tonight with a final thought. When things get tough and you're going through hell, please, please, yes, keep going. But take with you the wise words of Winnie the Pooh. You are braver than you believe. You are stronger than you seem. You are smarter than you think. Drive safely and never, never, never give up. <laughs>